As Brett mentioned, uh, there's lead credit uh, that uh, that green buildings they recognize the importance of moisture and occupant health, reliance on proper moisture management, and so as far as lead credit. A number of the topics we'll discuss, if you incorporate some of these ideas, that these can lead to uh, a higher rating for, for your projects. So let's talk a little bit first about indoor moisture. And these pictures are from, from my house, which is also a test bed for our research here. This house is almost 10 years old. We've been in the house uh, nine years this fall and it was constructed in 2010. It's a 2100 square foot ranch and you're seeing recent pictures of living room with uh, a, a ductless mini split heat pump, a one ton heat pump that's the bulk heating and cooling system as well as moisture management system for the home. The kitchen which consists of a recirculating kitchen hood to get particulates and cooking odors away from the cook, but above it, some vents that go to our smart ventilation system. And this is a heavily used kitchen. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have a, a spouse who loves to cook, doesn't realize our four kids are out of the house, thankfully, and, and cooks an immense amount of a variety of type of food. And, and so uh, this kitchen, is impacted by cooking as much as any kitchen uh, these days. And there's no grime, there's no uh, stains, there's no odors infused into, uh, into the kitchen or into the house. And, and it's managed by continuously having good ventilation system. The bathroom uh, in the upper corner, similarly, because of the way the ventilation system operates, that we exhaust from the bathroom and uh, and continuously moving air through in one of the modes of operation for uh, for the system that we have in place. The bathroom fully dries out. Towels, washcloths, as we'll discuss, uh, they fully dry out. There's no hints, indication, discoloration of any mold or mildew in this bathroom. And so the type of ventilation we'll be discussing, it works. And, um, and this is from firsthand knowledge of it working. The laundry room, which features a heat pump clothes dryer. So no outdoor vents, which with the vented clothes dryers has the disadvantage as far as moisture loads of pulling in outside air to replace the air that a vented dryer would be blowing out. This lets you keep your home sealed. And you can see the vent in the upper corner. So the heat pump clothes dryer, it does have some vapor that will vent in and uh, we'll see what that amount is. But my uh, wife who has a habit of some of her clothes pulling out about halfway through the drying cycle and hanging up and using this laundry room as a drying closet, again, no mold, mildew, stains, or any moisture at all. And the key is uh, a good ventilation system that uh, is going to keep moving air through, through the house. So here's what uh, moisture looks like in a home. Uh, this is from research data that we've collected uh, along with some analyses, and these are detailed more in the report we just released. But basically from one to four occupants on average, and of course there's no such thing as an average human being, so the scatter is quite wide, but on average you could expect to have occupants uh, add maybe one to five liters per day of water uh, for a house of one to four people in occupancy. And this is taking into account uh, moisture from respiration, moisture from cooking. And as you would read through the report, we do make some comments on gas cooking, but since our focus and mission is on a healthy home, we strongly advise against gas cooking. And, uh, and then 
significant moisture coming from towels and washcloths and wet shower surfaces. And a heat pump clothes dryer, about 20% of the moisture in a load of clothes. The vapor does come out of that, but it's not a significant amount, as you can see, when averaged on a daily basis. Uh, and then plants. Uh, this number is just based on some observations of watering plants. In our case, we have about 50 plants scattered around Equinox House, and, uh, and we put about six liters of water on them per week. A little more in the winter, a little less in the, the summer. But this gives you a rough idea how much moisture people are putting in. Infiltration varies with wind speed. And no matter how well you seal a home, it will change the infiltration rate as the wind speed changes. And if you read, uh, again, the link through our report, a report we did on uh, economically optimized duct systems, we have an appendix that links blower door, uh, air changes per hour at 50 pascals to infiltration. It's a very simple model um, and that allows linking then infiltration rate to wind speed and you're seeing a plot of that for a 2,000 square foot home uh, eight foot ceiling, so 16,000 square feet in volume. And basically, if you sealed a home to, well, basically just build a home, which six ACH of 50 pascals is basically what we see with conventional building without significant effort to seal the home, where 0 0.6 ACH, as many of you are aware, would be the level that you would look to achieve to hit passive house ratings. And the, uh, the amount of infiltration is proportional to the blower door uh, rating. So to the left, if we have about a seven, eight mile per hour wind, what's the typical wind speed average for many regions around North America, we would see about 140 CFM of infiltration in a six ACH home whereas we would see about 14 CFM of infiltration in say a passive house level sealed home. And, uh, and this is significant as far as our moisture management. We'll have an example that we'll look at that will, that will uh, indicate how much that impacts us. ASHRAE 62.2 ventilation schedule, the most current one, 2016, it, um, with smart ventilation, which is covered by section 4.6 in 62.2, smart ventilation requires that the ventilation system results in no more exposure to indoor pollutants than what ASHRAE ventilation standard would. And nominally, although it's not stated explicitly, this would be keeping the home at about a thousand parts per million of CO2 and to maintain a home at about a thousand parts uh, per million of CO2 would be about 20 CFM per occupant. And that's an occupant at what's considered sedentary level, but sitting, reading a book, office work type activity level. Some of the problems though with this fixed ventilation schedule, when we look at the lower end, that 52 uh, and a half CFM for a thousand square foot two bedroom home, you put four people in that, this home is polluted anytime there's people in it. No ifs, ands, buts about it. That's not enough airflow to keep uh, this, uh, this household healthy. At the other end, you go to what's currently the average size U.S. new construction home, about a 2,700 square foot, four bedroom home, you're ventilating constantly with 120 CFM. But this 2,700 square foot home, the average occupancy is only two and a half people. And so it's overventilated 
But on top of that, what's also uh, what we also find from our research is that the air quality is not good because even though an excessive amount of air is being blown into the home, it's not being delivered to where the people are located. So if you take uh, this 2,700 square foot home, divide it up among eight, 10 different uh, room areas that you're supplying with fresh air, that's maybe 10 to 15 CFM for this room or that room. You put two, three, four people in that room. That room is poorly ventilated. It's going to not have good air quality, even though 80, 90% of the home has very, very fresh air. Basically that fresh air is getting wasted. So we're gonna work an example though for a 2000 square foot three bedroom home that would require 90 CFM of ASHRAE ventilation. A little bit about the psychrometric chart. Our friend Willis Carrier in 1911 came up with this and published a paper on the psychrometric chart, which is an extremely clever way of capturing the effects of humidity and uh, temperature, or what we consider sensible conditioning. And on the left-hand side, what's called specific humidity or uh, a similar parameter humidity ratio, which, which we'll be using, basically the mass of water to the mass of the air, and relative humidity, which are the curved lines, which we use in the weather. And just uh, the main reason for relative humidity is we have some instruments that are sensitive to relative humidity. But when we're dealing with moving moisture in and out of air, humidity ratio or sp specific humidity more directly deal with the amount of water that's in air. Now marked on this roughly from about 68 degrees to about 74, 76 degrees is where most people feel comfortable. And then over a fairly broad humidity range up to about say 65% relative humidity. And that would be 0.01 to 0.011 or of humidity ratio, basically 1% of the air is water by mass. This would be the region that most people feel comfortable in, but, but it's very fuzzy. It depends on the time of year, depends on the clothing, your activity level, and personal preference. When we look at weather plotted on this psychrometric chart, this is Urbana, Illinois, and we're fortunate to, uh, as we tell people, we live in the middle of nowhere and we like being from nowhere. And uh, we have some of the worst weather in North America. This envelope that's drawn around hourly data for one of our weather years. In our second report that we'll release next month, we'll see how this envelope compares to weather in Miami, in Los Angeles, in Seattle, um, Minneapolis. And basically what you'll see is that this envelope is bigger, or in other words, Urbana has to deal with more extremes of weather in high temperature and humidity, low temperature than most any other place in uh, North America, that we have quite a few extremes to deal with. Now, as far as moisture transport into a home by infiltration or ventilation, the difference in the humidity ratio between inside and outside dictates how much water is going into a home or out of a home. So if we were trying to keep the inside of a home at 0 0.01 humidity ratio, basically about 72 degrees with 60% relative humidity, and the outside in this black, uh, the smaller black outline, the top of that, which is at 0 0.01, that's our summer average humidity for central Illinois, about 0 0.013. But you can see we do hit some extremes that will go as high as 0 0.023, something similar to what you'd see in Miami and New Orleans. The difference between that and the inside is going to determine how much water is carried into the house uh, during warm, humid conditions. 
So let's look at an example to see how to do a calculation. And it's not that uh, uh, these calculations get quite tedious if you do them for every month of the year and try to do the overall analysis by hand. So with uh, software that we'll talk about, um, you can much more conveniently and in a more efficient manner do these calculations. But the main point here is so that you see that it's not magic how you put these numbers together, what's going on inside of a computer uh, simulation model to come up with uh, moisture, uh, moisture amounts. So this 2,000 square foot home, three bedrooms, if it's ventilated with 62.2 uh, ventilation table, it'd be 90 CFM. We'd like to look at the daily summer dehumidification load for Urbana. So from that weather data we were just looking at, we have two occupants who are home 16 hours a day. And if we have a smart ventilation system that's only going to ventilate the amount of air, but distribute it efficiently to where it's needed in the home for the occupants, then uh, for the equivalent pollutant exposure, we would need about 27 CFM on average delivered to the home. Now, we're just calculating the average ventilation rate, but the reality with a smart ventilation unit is that it would be a much higher airflow in the range of, in our case, about 200 CFM delivered when people are there and where they need it in the home. But this 27 CFM sounds very low as an average flow rate when this table's telling you 90 CFM, and then layered on top of it is the infiltration. If we look at three contractors who I've named Contractor Loose, Contractor Tight, and Contractor Smart, Contractor Loose is building a six ACH home, uh, doesn't bother to attend workshops or webinars where they discuss the importance of sealing a home up and methods for doing that. And so that home with about a seven, eight mile an hour wind, as we discussed, has about 140 CFM of uh, infiltration. And then layered on it, if they are required to ventilate according to 62.2, they would also be putting in 90 CFM of air. Uh, ASHRAE does allow some allowance for uh, infiltration, but if you've looked at it, it's uh, complicated enough that I think probably most people don't try to get that fraction of allowance. But in any case, without accounting for that allowance, 230 CFM. Contractor Tight, who has looked at how to build a quality home that's very well sealed, has 0.6 ACH, which results in 14 CFM rather than 140, but still 90 CFM for a total of 104 CFM of infiltration ventilation air. Now I mentioned that uh, we're not explicitly talking about ERVs or HRVs, but in the report, we do discuss those and show psychrometrically what those are doing. But neither HRVs or ERVs are moisture handling systems. And, uh, and we discuss those points. They, uh, their energy exchange, an ERV for sure, as many of you know, does have an impact on moisture but it can be just as detrimental as it is beneficial depending on how you use it. But it is not a dehumidification system. And then Contractor Smart, the 27 CFM that's needed to keep the occupants at equivalent pollutant exposure, the 14 CFM from infiltration is automatically included with a smart ventilation system that has sensors to detect air quality and then layered on that would be 13 CFM that the ventilator senses would be needed to keep the air quality at that level for a total of 27 CFM. And again, I just want to make the point that even though you see what is a significant reduction in, in airflow, more than likely it's the homes with the continuous ventilation but with poor distribution that are going to have poor air quality where the occupants are and when they're at home, and then excellent air quality when nobody's needing it. I'd also make the comment that even though 27 CFM sounds low, 
if you ever put a spacesuit on or a diving uh, scuba gear, uh, the rate at which fresh air needs to be delivered to you for breathing is um, just a hundredth of 27 CFM. 27 CFM is basically what's needed to keep that environment around you so that this mixed air is roughly polluted. But if you're to wear a spacesuit or a still suit or something like that, much, much less fresh air is needed to be directly delivered to your nose. Um, the, Ty, uh, yeah. the question that came in was, um, and maybe you're going to get to this later, but what metric of air quality, you know, is considered poor when there's overventilation? Um, and, you know, just how does that relate to um, CO2 and VOC levels? Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll just mention, because uh, I won't be discussing that uh, directly, but in um, in some of our previous GHI webinars where we talk about smart ventilation, and then we do have uh, detailed reports on smart ventilation and smart air distribution on our website where we discuss that more directly. But nominally, people consider 1,000 ppm of CO2 with associated human generation of VOCs, alcohols and acetone and, and other things coming off of us from our metabolism, that that's, that's a level at which uh, if you put other people in the room with that person, about 20% of the populace would be dissatisfied with the air quality. And that historically, since about the 1930s, as data was collected uh, from placing a, a recently showered, uh, clean clothed human in a sealed room and blowing different uh, air flows through the room and having people smell the air coming out of that room, that uh, it was set based on 20% of the populace being dissatisfied, which to me seems like an enormous amount of people to have dissatisfied, but that's the state of the art and that's roughly persisted to today, even though you don't quite see that, for, for example, in the 62.2 ventilation table, it, um, it gets kind of masked by that. Our view is that you want to keep a home less than 800 parts per million, seven to 800 parts per million, and um, where outside air is now about 400 parts per million of CO2, where it used to be 300 parts per million when I was born in 1952, we're seeing that it's harder and harder to keep uh, indoor CO2 and associated pollutants at lower levels. But, but we actually would like to see 40 CFM per person when a house is occupied, supplied to to uh, keep the air quality good, uh, both for preference, but also it reduces the probability you're going to get sick when somebody with a cold or a flu comes in, as well as just keeps the air quality healthier. So, so that there, there's a lot of uh, detail to that, and I recommend seeing those reports to uh, to learn more about that. This calculation for the net water balance based on infiltration, uh, I put together a simple relation, 50 times the CFM, the total of infiltration and ventilation, average infiltration and ventilation, times the humidity ratio difference. And so as we mentioned for Urbana, the average outdoor humidity is about 0.013. And if we would like to keep the inside at 0 0.01, so we have a 0 0.003, uh, you know, a very tiny three tenths of a percent of water that we're going to change in the air uh, in order to make it more comfortable inside. And uh, with two occupants who are there 16 hours a day, but just using our roughly two and a half kilogram per day for the occupant showering, breathing, um, moisture addition. Those are the things we need in order to calculate the water. And if we look at these three homes for contractor, loose, tight, and smart, um, hopefully this slide's not too busy, but for our 2,000 square foot home, two occupants that with 
the amount of infiltration and ventilation in Urbana in the bottom, the average dehumidification would be about uh, 37 kilograms or liters per day, or roughly about 80 pints per day. In going to uh, contractor tights home, sealing up the home gets rid of about half of the uh, half of the airflow through the home. Most of it now is dominated by the ventilation system, uh, whether supply or exhaust only ventilation or HRV, ERV ventilation. And this cuts it basically in half to about 18 liters per day, kilograms of water per day, or about 38, 40 pints per day. And then if we're ventilating as we need it, we're automatically sensing air quality. And uh, along the lines of what we were just discussing on air quality, you cannot smell good air quality. So when 20% of the people, when 20% of the populace is dissatisfied with air quality, it doesn't mean they're smelling anything, just something doesn't seem right in it. And the level at which air is healthy is a level that our noses just are not sense enough to detect. A lot of the things in the air that cause us problems are not detectable by our nose. So in the smart ventilation system, we have about 14 CFM that's coming in through whatever nooks and crannies or cracks that are left, as well as then uh, 13 CFM that we're automatically bringing in as needed to keep the air quality high. And this cuts us down again to about six to seven liters of water per day or about 14 pints of water per day. Let's expand the example to look at what happens in Miami, Phoenix, and Urbana. And these are good examples of a place that needs dehumidification all year. Phoenix, as arid as it is, there's part of the year it's monsoonal uh, weather during the fall when dehumidification could be desirable. And then Urbana in which um, we get those golf blasts from Houston and uh, Louisiana up this way in the summer, as well as those Arctic blasts and polar vortex from Minneapolis in the winter, uh, just not as long of a duration, but to look at what, what variation we have among these locations. Miami for contractor loose in the summer, instead of 0 0.013 as we have in Urbana, the average outside humidity ratio is about 0 0.018. Almost 2% of the air is water in, in Miami at that time of year. And for a loosely built home, 6 ACH at 50 pascals and two occupants, we have about 94 liters of dehumidification capacity that's needed in order to keep the inside of the house at about 72 degrees Fahrenheit with 60% humidity. In the wintertime, the outside humidity ratio drops down to about 0 0.011. And if we did still want to hold at about 60% humidity inside, um, then we, uh, we would pull about 14 liters of water out per day. But I suspect most people at that level if their house is going up to 65% are probably fine with that as well. And so they may, may not be dehumidifying. We move over to Phoenix and it's heavy moisture is about 0 0.012, not that high relative to, to uh, say the indoor 0 0.01 humidity ratio. But if we did want to control that moisture, we'd be pulling about 25 liters per day out of the loose, loose home, poorly sealed home. In the wintertime, the humidity ratio 0 0.005 is well below 0 0.01. And the lower humidity that people feel comfortable is very fuzzy and nebulous. It depends on itchy skin, nosebleeds, breathing uh, sensitivities. Some people are more or less comfortable with that. So, uh, but 0 0.005 is roughly about a 30% humidity ratio 
indoors and um, with 68 degree Fahrenheit. And so for uh, Phoenix, if you did not do anything moisture management wise, so zero humidification, dehumidification, uh, and just let it float, it would be about 32% relative humidity. And then Urbana is um, humid in the summer, more humid for sure than Phoenix. And, uh, and then in the winter, because of the poor ceiling, that if one were to keep it at about 30% relative humidity indoors, you'd be adding about 20 liters of water per day. In going to contractor type, we see similar trends that we roughly cut things in half by uh, significantly sealing the home so that most of the moisture movement is by, uh, by ventilation. And then with smart ventilation that we are, uh, we're further reducing the, uh, the need for moisture management and we've knocked 94 liters of water per day in Miami down to about 13 liters per day on average. Uh, Phoenix similarly knocked down and Urbana as well. On, in the winter time, which is true for Equinox House, that uh, with the plants we have, the cooking, our activities, we're roughly at about 40% relative humidity. And you can view this for yourself since there's about four years of online data uh, available through our website, as well as live data uh, what's happening in the inside Equinox now as far as uh, CO2, volatile organic compounds, temperature, and humidity. Briefly, four methods for dehumidifying a house, and there are many other methods, but the ones that are the conventional ones, the ones that are available, the ones that are efficient and economically efficient. The standard air conditioner, which for most homes would be the primary means to move moisture out when dehumidification is needed. In our case, a smart heat pump ventilator that has the capability to remove some water. Another new technology, a heat pump water heater, or what's also known as a hybrid water heater, which is basically a window air conditioner that's pulling heat and, and condensing water out of the inside air and putting that into your hot water. And then finally, when the sensible heat ratio, and the sensible heat ratio is the, sensible cooling is the cooling that goes to changing the temperature of air, where we describe latent cooling as the energy that goes to changing the humidity. It's kind of hidden. It's changing moisture level, but not necessarily temperature level. If we take the ratio of the sensible cooling to the total cooling, if that ratio gets less than 0.5 or more than 50% of the cooling is for latent, then typically a dehumidifier would be desirable. And above 0.5, the other three uh, should be in many cases able to handle the moisture load, but we'll discuss that. And these other ways, uh, for sure, these have been studied for decades, uh, not centuries. And um, there are other ways to dehumidify, but these are not readily off the shelf or cost effective or practical for household use. Um, but just to note that there are other means. Within an air conditioner, uh, and as a basis, we'll assume a one ton mini split that's typical of the ones you find on the market today, that these will remove somewhere in the range of 40 to 80 liters per day. So a three ton, say more of a central air conditioner, you might scale that up a bit more. Uh, but many of the homes that we're dealing with, high performance, progressive builder uh, based homes, one to one and a half tons of uh, cooling and heating uh, seems to be managing uh, pretty reasonably sized homes with, with good occupancy. So uh, your typical one ton air conditioner of a mini split type heat pump, somewhere around 40 to 80 liters per day. This is data from one manufacturer and it changes with the indoor humidity ratio. The more humid it is inside, so this gray area is roughly where 
most people feel comfortable, say 50 to 60% relative humidity with about say 70, 72, 74 degrees inside. And then an outside temperature that the heat pump's working with ranging from about say the 70s up to the 90s. And so some impact on how hard the unit has to work. So as it gets hotter outside, a little less moisture capacity, but pretty significant uh, moisture capacity on a per ton basis. Now these units also typically have a dry mode or a dehum mode. And from, uh, from the units that we've collected data from, we've seen where these might reach a moisture handling ca capacity of about say up to 80 liters per day. Sensible heat ratio in conventional air conditioning operation is somewhere around 75%, but in this dry mode, it can drop down to about 50%. And so for example, in, in my house, uh, when we do start getting up above 60, 65%, I'll put the uh, ductless mini split into dry mode or dehum mode for about eight hours. And then um, maybe once a week when we're in the thick of things in uh, July and August in the house. And, and that's enough to bring it down to maybe upper 50s and then it just kind of coasts up over the next week or so to maybe lower 60%, depending on the weather and the activity. But it, it's a very easy thing to do and um, gives us the ability to control the moisture nicely. Um, a smart conditioning ventilator that uh, has a heat pump incorporated into it. In the case of ours, we can remove about 10 liters of water per day. One of the nice features is that when outside heavy humid air is coming in, that in conditioning it with a heat pump, we're able to pull moisture out of it very efficiently when the moisture is most concentrated. And so this gets rid of quite a bit of water and then the water that the additional water it needs to be managed is managed by, um, by the mini split heat pump. Heat pump water heaters uh, from our research data, we roughly see about half a liter per day per person. And the interesting thing about that from the previous table on human generation, moisture generation in a home, our respiration roughly puts about half a liter of water in the air per day. And so your heat pump water heaters operation scales with the number of occupants and the moisture it's pulling out uh, from our data in any case seems to scale with the number of people nicely. And, and it's a significant contribution. And then finally a dehumidifier can remove as much water as you want. You just buy the capacity you want. The important thing to note is that a dehumidifier is all contained within the house. And so the heat that's removed from the water vapor to condense it into a liquid and the power to run the dehumidifier for running the compressor, these are then rejected internally inside the house instead of outside the house as in the heat pump and the smart ventilator. So this heat has to be removed by the air conditioner in the house. And if we look at dehumidification efficiency, what's called an energy factor, and it's basically the kilograms or liters per kilowatt hour of electric running that dehumidification process. The open circles show um, the dehumidification efficiency the energy factor for, or efficiency factor for two very uh, high quality dehumidification units. And the rating point for Energy Star is 80 Fahrenheit with 60% humidity. And you can see it, these two units have about 2.4 and, and close to a 3.0 uh, energy factor. But 80 degrees and 60% isn't typical where people would keep their homes. It'd be more in the say 70 to 75 degree range with a lower humidity. And, and so I show the energy factor drop in those open circles for the dehumidifier as is. But then since that has to go through an air conditioner, and again, using this high performance mini split air conditioner, um, 
as what's taking the dehumidifier heat out. The solid dots below it are the energy factor that accounts for the air conditioning needed to remove the dehumidifier uh, heat out of the house. And you can see that that's a pretty significant drop in its actual energy factor. And so, uh, and, and the other result is that you more efficiently remove water with a typical air conditioner than you do through a dehumidifier. And so the conclusion on that is get as much water out of the air in a home with the air conditioner first, and then a dehumidifier if you can't avoid it. Just looking at some uh, real data from, this is a picture of Equinox House, which looks a lot like our example house, 2,100 square feet, one ton mini split heat pump, smart heat pump ventilation, heat pump water heater. And this is real data over the 2012, and we have about four years of this type of data. Uh, this is actually a pretty humid summer. More typically, we're at about 500 liters or so of water to keep the indoor at about 60, 65% relative humidity with a temperature of about 72 inside. So we don't sacrifice comfort at all inside and definitely don't sacrifice air quality. And um, of this total 700 liters of water collected, the bulk of that was from the mini split heat pump, about almost 60%, about 30% from the smart ventilator, which was removing water from the fresh air as it came in, as well as removing water when it was in a recirculation mode. And then finally, the heat pump water heater. Uh, and you see the heat pump water heater is pretty much going with the shower usage, the daily shower usage, or about a half a liter per person per day. This is what daily data actually looks like. And it's, it's a pain collecting this data. Every damn day, you take a bucket, see how much condensate was collected, and you write it down. Yes, there's ways to automate it, but with uh, over 40 years of collecting data from homes in a variety of situations, there's no better way than to get a bucket of water, look at it, write down other characteristics going in a daily log. And then in our case, with three ways that we're condensing water, heat pump water heater, smart ventilator, and uh, mini split heat pump, you're doing three of these buckets a day. And, and it changes. The weather is very humid, as we saw, um, getting up to very hot, humid conditions. You have a lot of people or a lot of activity. So more ventilation, more human moisture generation. It's all over the map, but on average, this is about six, seven liters per day as we came up with for our average dehumidification needs for a tightly sealed uh, high performance home. Finally, let's look at some characteristics uh, over the course of the year to just see, and we'll use Miami because it's ground zero for dehumidification. Key West, maybe a little more. Uh, we also have modeled San Salvador where uh, we've been involved in a project. Uh, so there's there's more moist areas in the world, but but this is this is right up there. Um, in looking at loose, tight, and smart, you can see on a monthly basis from January month one to December, it peaks around July, August, September, as you'd expect. And from our hand calculation, we're at about 90 liters per day, 92, 94. And this is a computer simulation using our zeros model, which is free to use online software. And you can contact us if you'd like to get linked into it. But it's uh, it's one of the few models that properly does and has been validated against moisture loads with data like what I was just showing you. Um, so you can see the substantial reduction in moisture management by sealing the home and then smartly ventilating it. Now, when we look at the heating and cooling loads, now Miami doesn't have a heating load, so there's no orange bars on that. In our report on overall house characteristics, when we look at some other locations, um, we do have the heating season as well as the uh, moisture, the humidification needs. In the case of Miami, we're dehumidifying all year and the latent capacity peaks in the summer and it's much greater in this loosely sealed home 
than the sensible cooling, the blue bars. And that gives us a sensible heat ratio that's much less than 0.5. So this home definitely to maintain comfort, you're going to add a dehumidifier on top of the other conditioning equipment. When we get to uh, a, a tight home, but still with quite a bit of uh, ventilation airflow bringing moisture in, we start seeing the sensible heat ratio start to increase, a significant drop in the latent capacity needed. So an overall improvement, but still significantly low sensible heat ratios where this home as well, uh, it would be wise to add a dehumidifier. And then in smartly ventilating, now if you added four people to this home, the ventilation needs would go up. If you're having a party, if you have other things going on, the uh, sensible heat ratio may drop below this average sensible heat ratio. As we saw with the daily data, it's, it fluctuates quite wildly. But this is basically showing that by sealing it up and ventilating smart, we can get to a level where most of the, the cooling can be managed with, say, uh, today's high performance air conditioners and um, putting it in dry mode, which is still a very efficient way to remove moisture. And then for those exceptional times, maybe still having a dehumidifier, but not having to use it as often. Um, but basically getting moisture under control by, by sealing it and then ventilating as you need for air quality needs. Now, as we then look at the energy associated with it, the loose home would have about, for this 2000 square foot home, a pretty sizable electric bill each year, a uh, quite large um, solar system in, uh, in order to hit net zero, over 12,000 kilowatt hours per year where the, the smart home would drop that significantly, almost in half to less than 7,000 kilowatt hours per year. And a lot of that directly associated with the dehumidification load, as well as also in sealing it and ventilating it properly, dropping the sensible cooling load. So last comments on household humidification and um, sorry, I'm running a little bit over here. This is uh, the last, slide. Um, if you seal up a home and if you smartly ventilate it as needed, you typically, even in very cold climates, and a lot of our work is up in, uh, in Vermont and upper New England and very cold areas, that uh, a home that is primarily polluted by its occupants and not by its occupants' activities that uh, the humidity will naturally stay pretty comfortable, say above 30%. As I mentioned, if you look at our online data for my house, we're typically 40 to 45% in, in a very cold, you know, we hit minus 15 Fahrenheit in our winters. But if you do need humidification uh, for whatever reason, we recommend that you have steam or vapor injection, basically boiling the water and having the vapor enter. So you're adding the energy to the water to get it into essentially adding water gas or water vapor directly. And this is self sanitizing. There is maintenance as uh, you have to watch for buildups of minerals and things in um, on your heating surfaces. But as opposed to droplet evaporation or cold water injection where you're spraying water either as a film over some porous media or directly as droplets. But in this case, uh, what's been found is that there's quite a bit of sanitizing needed. You need to watch that water reservoir as mold, bacteria, endotoxins, and other things form. Um, you know, we've just seen people not that healthy and, and looking like it's due to uh, this type of water addition to their home. So we recommend uh, the steam injection if you're going to do that. But even better would be if you have enough daylight to grow plants. This plant root dirt matrix has been found in studies to somehow be sanitizing the water so that you're getting 
great clean water vapor added. Um, hopefully seeing some plants around your house also adds to a peace of mind and comfort within your house. And um, as I mentioned, uh, in our house, it's, it's a big part of our moisture balance in the winter. So Hi, um, yep. Can you go back to that last slide and just yeah. um, confirm that uh, droplet evaporation is your conventional humidif humidification system? Is that would that be an accurate statement? I, I don't I don't know the percentage because you do see both the steam injection and the droplet or like a rotating wheel that is going through water or having water sprayed on it. I don't know the percentage of one over the other. Um, that would be interesting to know, but it, it seems to me like the droplet evaporation might be more um, more common. Okay. But I, I don't have numbers on that. Uh, as far as like you know, when somebody has a cold or is congested and they put one of these in their room, the steam would be the one that's boiling the water. Uh, right. you know, the little electric heater and the droplet. Uh, is somehow atomizing or slinging droplets up, and um, and those need to be watched as well. Okay, and you, you're talking about the more the decentralized ones, but I'm talking about more of a whole house dehumidifier. Yes, but but yeah, the same is true there that you have both types there: the steam injection for the central or whole okay. house, as well as the droplet, and. Um, uh, you'll find a newsletter article we wrote about two years ago on endotoxins, and that cites a study that where they found the highest level of endotoxins. And endotoxins are kind of the debris of dead bacteria. It's kind of the, from the shell of uh, dead uh, bacteria that are also these particles, even when they're from harmless bacteria, these particles off of these bacterial shells are very toxic and they cause things such as Monday fever and uh, uh, Bible printers fever. But it, it's something that gives you a fever like symptom, can make you very, very sick and can also act as an adjuvant in, say, accelerating or accentuating other things that are making you sick. And and these cold water evaporators have been found to be huge sources of endotoxins. You know, the magnitudes of endotoxins above what you typically have in a home without it. So, and endotoxins fatigue you. Very tiny, tiny fractions of endotoxins uh, create fatigue in many people. Thanks for watching. Please continue to watch the next part of the session to complete the course and get your continuing education credits. Be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs.